Okay, we have a great group here today. I'm super excited to see uh, so many attendees and so many familiar faces. Um, thanks so much for coming today. Um, we're going to be hearing from an amazing speaker today, Dr. Jack Cohen. Uh, so grateful to have him with us. Um, so welcome. I'm, I'm excited for what's ahead. And I'd like to remind everyone that during this presentation, it would be great for you to use the chat function to ask questions. You can ask a question at any time during the presentation. We'll take um, questions at the very end though in Q&A session. So I'll, I'll be watching the chat and kind of um, gather up those questions at the end. And to ask a question, you'll just, I think, go to the bottom of your screen and look for the chat um, button at the bottom and then type in your question. Um, you can either type it to the whole group using everyone, um, to everyone, or you can um, send it specifically to me. My name is Adriana Stegnero. Also during the um, workshop, please mute your mic or your phone unless you're speaking. And um, actually, we won't really be having speaking until, um, or, or we won't have uh, audience participation until the very end of the, of the meeting. So please keep yourself on mute until the end of the meeting. Uh, another note is just that this workshop will be recorded and available afterwards for you to watch again or share with your friends. Mm -hmm. It'll be posted on YouTube and sent out um, to all the uh, registrants um, via email. Um, and uh, we may have a couple of other uh, resources that we'll share with you then too. Okay. All right, now I wanted to um, just hand it over to Arthur Dawson, who's a member of the Forest Working Group to say a few words about the, the group. All right, thank you, Adriana. And <clears throat> it's good to be here and welcome everybody. Uh, I've been given the honor of introducing the Sonoma County Forest Conservation Working Group to our presenter, Dr. Jack Cohen. And I know we're all looking forward very much to your presentation. Uh, in the strictest sense, uh, we're not really an organization. We're not a government agency. We're not an organization of professional foresters or firefighters. We're not a nonprofit that manages land and we're not a land-based community practicing stewardship. We're not any of those things alone but we are all those things together. We've had a long and fruitful participation and support from the Sonoma County Agricultural Preservation and Open Space District, Sonoma Land Trust, CAL FIRE, Fire Safe Sonoma, the Sonoma and Gold Ridge Resource Conservation Districts, University of California Cooperative Extension, Santa Rosa Junior College, uh, Sonoma Ecology Center, Gualala Community Forest, Pepperwood Preserve, Audubon Canyon Ranch, Baseline Consulting, the California Native Plant Society, the Wildlands Conservancy, Monin's Real Community. And I apologize if I've forgotten anyone, but as you can see, it's a very uh, a wide ranging group of participants. Um, what we have in common is our love for forests and the desire to learn from each other. Over the years, the forest group has provided countless opportunities for people working on everything from fire protection to conservation to collaborate in a forum where everyone is, is heard and respected. From all this cross-pollination, we've come to understand how much more effective we can be working together rather than in our separate silos. Perhaps our most important work is educating private landowners and the public. Sonoma County is the most parcelized county in the state which creates a real challenge to effective forest management. So under the banners of our individual organizations, as well as the forest group, we reach out with workshops, conferences, public talks, assistance with grants, and developing community wildfire protection plans. When the wildfires of 2017 hit, the forest group already had years of experience collaborating on issues of fire protection and vegetation management. With our collective knowledge and wide ranging connections, we were able to assist recovery efforts and build public support for innovative strategies like prescriptive burning. I wish I had time to introduce everyone individually. Instead, I'll close by saying how grateful I am for the tremendous amount I've learned and benefited from being part of the forest group and how much respect and admiration I have for all of you. And it's been a lot of fun as well. 
And now I'd like to turn it over to Rob Gross, who will introduce our speaker, Jack Cohen. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Arthur, I, um, I can't come close to all those uh, credentials. I'm just a, a lone ranger up here, Lake County. I see uh, uh, Jan Janet Ruiz is there too, so welcome. I wanna thank uh, Adriana and, and uh, the group overall for allowing this to happen on, on your time and with your efforts especially on this one, which I was uh, remiss on. So I, I, thank, I thank you for that and Arthur for your uh, lead into it, explaining what the group does. And of course, uh, Jack, who we're gonna hear from uh, on this webinar. I appreciate er everything you've done, Jack, today, uh, that you're gonna do today and the preparation for that, as well as your efforts through the decades of your work in the field and in the various labs and all the outreach you've done incredible number of publications. Uh, I admire your perseverance through the overwhelming socio-political resistance, which is pretty loud in this state, unfortunately. So I, I do really appreciate that. Jack is a pioneer in this wildfire research with a focus on home protection. He's studied uh, at, at various universities and earned his PhD. He is known as a research physical scientist, as you can see from his title. I had to look that one up, but it deals with the physical properties of natural phenomena, not the, the, the living organisms like bugs and mammals that I do as a biologist. Importantly, he has some background in firefighting as well. He's been on crews, he was with a hotshot crew, and he's been on the lines of fires over the years. He told me uh, once when we were meeting that about a burn over where the fire burned over him, he was in a safety shelter and he, he described it as a sensory overload. As he lays in this little aluminum fire shelter, which is just barely bigger than your body, he tells me how it gets so hot and the wind blowing the branches off the trees all around him, he thinks he's gonna get crushed. And then the longest few minutes later, it passes over and he was, uh, he was alive Thank God he's alive today and can share this with us, this valuable information today. He's gonna to focus on the preventative actions that we can all take to save ourselves, our homes, our communities, and importantly, free up the firefighting community so that they can suppress fires when it's realistic. Jack has also been a member of many administrative and advisory teams on wildfires of all sizes all over the country. He's broadly experienced and published on a large number of research and popular papers, mostly involving fire, fire behavior and impacts, home ignition and exactly, exactly how that occurs. That's what we're going to hear a lot of today. And that's what I found very fascinating when I'm listening to, to all the input after all the fires we've had here in Lake County, and we are literally surrounded by them. Uh, there was a big difference and some missing information that I heard he would produce and we weren't getting down here. I became really devoted to pursuing a lot of information through him. I had, was able to get in touch with him directly before he retired. We spoke many times, we emailed a lot. And finally I said, Jack, I'm gonna come up to Missoula, but I need to meet you. So we met for an hour, which went into a long day. And I spent the rest of the week at the station and my brain was feeling like it was dripping out my ears by the time I got done. I had so many papers, I had so many short interviews, it was really exceptional. The critical message today is instead we're gonna hit, we're, in California, we keep hearing about post ignition, what you know the fire trucks do, what the bombers are doing. We're seeing 150,000 spent on new choppers bless the heart of the fire suppressionist, but Jack's gonna look at a different, a different point and that's the prevention and how to avoid home ignition. If your house doesn't ignite, it won't burn. The wildfires we've been seeing in the recent years are driven by extreme fire conditions, which Jack is gonna explain. And with ignition, it has led us to horrific re results repeatedly. Tremendous number of home fire loss. I'm sorry, homes are lost in the fires. People are killed. Oh my God, the money's uh, in Middletown. You see people walking around with, with, with blank eyes afterwards. The, pe the, the post-traumatic stress is overwhelming. The destruction is tremendous. And I had that re reminded to me when I went up to Paradise recently and I saw the same darn thing 
just a couple of years ago instead of in 2015. This year, the LNU came within 1.8 miles of us, and then the glass fire swept across from Napa Valley all the way to Santa Rosa, destroying everything along the way. And then finally decided to come back up to Middletown and haunt us, stopping on the Livermore Ranch 1.2 miles away. We've had enough. We're well, we're well traumatized. It is very difficult. And we look forward to Jack's presentation and see what he can tell us how to deal with these extreme fire conditions, how to, how to, how to protect our homes, even under these extreme fire conditions that have just keep coming back and back with, with, with those conditions. National Fire Prevention Association tells us that only three to 5% of all the wildfires are extreme and extreme wildfires are not possible to control. They're just too, too hot and too vigorously burning. But if only 3.5, I'm sorry, three and three to 5% of them are that extreme and they cannot put them out when they're under those extreme conditions, we're still losing homes. But Jack has an answer and has a good answer. Hope we can all listen to him and let go of our conventions, see if his science doesn't make sense to you too, and then hopefully take action and save yourself and our community. With that, Jack, I wanna thank you for coming again, and I appreciate your time and efforts. I appreciate everybody being here and listening. Here we go. Jack, thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. I'll stop sharing my screen now so that Jack can share his. And, and, and really, this wouldn't have happened without Rob's help. So thank you, Rob, for being the catalyst, um, bringing, bringing this great expert to our forest working group. So thank you very much, Rob. And thank you as of the forestry group for inviting me to give you a presentation. Uh, because of the internet, uh, Presentations. I'm going to go ahead and uh, remove myself from the screen and hopefully everybody else uh, so that we see are the slides being presented uh, during this presentation. Uh, with, for that, I apologize for all of you who want to keep tabs on me. But um, let's, uh, let's go ahead and I'm going to start the presentation and hopefully we remove uh, all of our uh, personal view windows. So if you would hide your self views or uh, Adriana, eliminate uh, self views. Perfect. Thank you very much. Welcome all. And let's take a look at community fire destruction during extreme wildfires. With the perspective, what we're at is looking at this community fire destruction during extreme wildfires as a home ignition problem. So clearly what we're going to be talking about is wildland urban uh, fire disasters. And that is the minutes and businesses that burn to total destruction during extreme wildfire conditions. But let's recognize that wildland fire is more than just a threat to our habitation. So to, to effectively manage wildland fire and to prevent our wildland urban fire disasters, we need to recognize the total wildland fire context, recognize it as a natural disaster that is an appropriate ecological process, as well as a natural hazard. What we tend to focus on, what tends to motivate us in terms of our, our fear and loathing of, of wildfire is the natural hazard as an initial of community burning. So let's start with wildland fire as a natural disturbance. First of all, we need to recognize wildland fire occurrence is inevitable. There is absolutely nothing 
in our recent history and certainly not in our natural history that in anything other than the inevitability of wildland fire. And in fact, look at the natural history of wildland fire. We find that with little exception, all of our North American ecosystems developed with and were maintained there. Importantly, ignited by humans a lot and lightning since the end of the ice age. So for more than 12 years with the retreat of ice sheets and the development of the ecosystems that largely current and certainly current existed with European settlement, fire was a very critical ecological factor in of what we've come to take for granted. And that with European settlement, there was an elimination of Native American burn along with the land use behavior that changed due to agriculture, urban development, and modern attempts at fire, wildfire, and that greatly reduced and changed the occurrence of wildland fire. So specifically for years, wildfire suppression has largely kept 98% of wildfires small, largely eliminating its historical ecological influence. And we're essentially reaping that, that the results of that today. So of the 2% of wildfires that escape initial attack become extreme under the most severe of weather conditions. Pablo winds, the Santa Anas, the offshores, and the extremely dry conditions. That occurrence is less than 1% of the time. Due to our unintended consequences of intense wildfire suppression, we've largely increased the potential for extreme wildfire conditions over extensive areas. So that's when the wildland urban fire disasters occur during these extreme wildfires. Well, so let's segue into wildland fire as a natural hazard. The history is not just recent regard to the destruction of, of communities during extreme wildfires. When we look back into our history, particularly of European settlement in North America, particularly in this period of 1870 to 1919, and oh, by the way, fire has have called this period the great barbecue of America. So this is the period when very large wildfires, intense wildfires over extensive areas like Peshtigo and the Michigan and, and the Hinkley fire burned, resulted in considerable destruction and fatalities. And by the way, the 1871 Peshtigo, which nearly everybody knows nothing about unless you live in the lake states, that occurred at the same time as the Great Chicago Fire under the same conditions. So interestingly, over 2,000 civilian fatalities occurred during these fires at this period, and numerous entire towns and villages were burned up. So, well, so fire suppression had very little to do with the cause of these fires. The, the, the setup for these fires climate change at that particular time, significant climate change. So what we're looking at is the, the normal fall, primarily fall and late summer conditions, producing extreme conditions, particularly strong winds and conditions. And in the case of this period, we're talking about extensive development of slash and burn agriculture and timber harvesting, leaving wide areas of enormous amounts of slash and of course with slash and burn agriculture, 
burning on an almost continual basis. So when the extreme conditions, the severe weather conditions occurred, there was continuity of heavy loads of dead material slash material that was able to spread the fires. Well, so after that, the period 1920 to 1984 and 1985 will become more obvious as importance, we still had the, the, what we have come to call the wildland urban fire problem. In this particular case, it was not the, the age of settlement was largely concluded. And now we have less than 100 civilian fatalities, actually over 400 firefighter burn over and about 5,000 homes were destroyed during this period. Well, so what happened in 1985? Well, 1,400 homes were destroyed, primarily in Florida, North Carolina. That was the, the wake up, because what also occurred in California had been occurring in that prior period when people just sort of kissed it off as, oh, well, that's a California problem. So when other states began to get involved, having their communities burned to some extent, that motivated the National Urban Interface Initiative of federal, state, and local agencies, which resulted in the current FireWise, Fire Adapted Communities, and other programs. So how has our national recognition of this wildland, urban, and in those days, an interface problem influenced the occurrence of wildland urban fire disasters. Well, so let's take at a table. Starting in 1990, these, it's not an all-inclusive list, but here is a, a good list of a fairly representative sampling of all the wildland urban fires, the Destruction of more than a hundred houses associated with a wildfire. And what's notable is the next uh, table, where there's a list since 1990 of all fires and accumulation of fires, not only over a hundred houses, but over a thousand homes destroyed during the and interestingly enough, when we look at 2018, where in California it was Carr, Camp, and Wolsey, that resulted in about 16,000 homes totally destroyed. Interestingly, by comparison, between 1985 and 1990, nationally, there were only 9,000 homes totally destroyed during wildfires, associated with wildfires. So the question might be asked, given since 1985, what has been the result of our national record of this problem? And largely what we've done is to increase suppression resources and produce federal, state, and collaborations. But they have not effectively abated the increasing trend of wildland urban fire disasters. But what we have done with our motivation to intensify the uh, capability of fire suppression, our national focus on wildfire as a natural hazard with suppression as the principal response, our, and, and particularly for the protection of communities, we have continued fire largely not occurring as an appropriate factor in the particularly in the western US and com communities largely have not become ignition resistant extreme wildfire conditions and hence increasing wildland urban fire disasters so we have a conundrum and and this conundrum uh, I will um, 
give you an example. I was watching a NOVA program and they were interviewing one of the incident commanders during the, uh, it was, he was essentially in paradise during the 2018 campfire. And he was asked, well, what about fire as an ecological process? And he recognized wild as an ecological process, but then raised the issue of, well, how can we have wildfire occurrence and communities? So that raises the, the conundrum of how can we have wildland fire as an appropriate ecological factor that human benefits to us without having wildland urban fire disaster. Is this even possible to reconcile? So wildfires are inevitable and thus extreme wildfires are inevitable. So does this mean that wildland urban fire disasters? Well, and my answer to that is no. So given current best available science for under how homes ignite, Wildland urban fire destruction during extreme wildfire hazard is a readily preventable human disaster. Distinguishing now between a natural disaster, which I don't think really anywhere occurs on this planet, given our understanding of how these happen, the connection between the natural disturbance and the human disaster is that we need to adapt to the inevitability. So in considering this as a human disaster, wildland urban science reveals opportunities for preventing wildland urban fire disasters without necessarily controlling extreme wildfires. Well, that's a pretty amazing statement that I've just made. So is the ability to prevent wildland urban fire disasters without controlling wild consistent with how we think about how wildland urban fire disasters occur. Well, let's take a sampling of the perceptions expressed in the media through interviews about our perception of wildland fire being inconceivably disconnected from the wildland urban fire disaster. So the firestorm descended like hell on the foothill neighborhoods and laid them to waste. The wildfire swept the community with a tsunami of flame. The wild exploded houses in flames, leaving destruction in its path. It was like a war zone. An incredible overused metaphor and analogy. But when we take a look at a scene like this, so Shortly after this occurred, I was called by journalists and asked the question, can you explain the unusual pattern of destruction? And my answer immediately was, no, this is the typical pattern of destruction. When we look at this, we see total home destruction, thinking, oh, well, it must have been some intense exposure to some enormous amount of energy. And, and when we look at this, we see total destruction. And I suggest people see what they believe and ignore. So we see the destruction and somehow we miss all the unconsumed vegetation this destruction, which significantly hints at the fact that our perceptions of how it happens and thus the opportunities to keep it from happening are, are getting in our way. So typical patterns of wildland urban fire destruction do not support walls of flame sweeping through communities and wildfires don't literally explode how so when we look at this scene from the 1993 Laguna fire, we see what later became the house 
of the, the house that survived without protection. Oh, clearly this is a miracle house when within this scene, which by the way is relatively narrow because there are other houses off to the left that also didn't ignite. But this miracle house is sitting in the destruction that we pay attention to and yet what else in this scene didn't burn? That's right, miracle vegetation. So it's not just that this house had discontinuous vegetation below it, because look at all the rest of the location where the vegetation didn't burn. So how does something like this happen? Well, like this. So in this particular case, these were ignited from lofted burning embers and the wildfire didn't even get into this neighborhood as flames. We look at the Alamos destruction, one block inside that western location of Al Los Alamos, and we see unconsumed vegetation, total destruction. Well, what does that tell us immediately? Well, when we continue to look at this, destruction next to green vegetation, and if you look at the images of this, we see that split rail fence behind the property, the direction that this surface fire spread from the high intensity Cerro Grande fire in Los spread continuously through a pine needle litter bed under the fence without igniting it to contact and what was flammable around the houses to destroy them. So let's take a look at a video of when those houses were destroyed. We see homes burning hours after the wildfire passed the community. Intense wildfire never spread to this residential area. And houses are not burning, or houses are burning, but the canopies the tree canopies are not burning. We're looking through tree canopy at the burning. And by the way, just across the street from that, if you were to turn around and just look at the house across the street, you would never have a hint that there was this kind of a disaster. So this is, this is an example of this house igniting from lofted burning embers and or density surface fire spreading to contact the structure. So when we look at unconsumed tree canopies amid the total destruction of home, it indicates that wildfire flames did not spread through the community. Why? Well, because they're still there. And the burning trees did not ignite the homes. The burning, the, the burned trees adjacent to and over the home were ignited by the burning. And, and the way I determined that is by doing examinations of these disasters to look at the charring that identified that the trees around the homes didn't ignite first and then ignite the home. And it looks the same even in the Victoria fires, the Melbourne fires in Australia, where 173 civilian fatalities and we have this sense of explosive fire behavior. It was, it was, there were long distance embers that were lofted out of the main intense fire that landed in these areas that were just outside of Melbourne that ignited spot ignitions that then spread continuously across the surface. And in many cases trapped, were unaware until it was too late. They evacuated and were overcome by surface fire and higher intensity on their escape. 
we look at 2017 in Napa, same kind of pattern. The car fire, same. 2020 was no different. Commonly, communities burn by fire spreading through residential fuels, the vegetation and structures within the community. Homes are burning, homes ignite and burn hours after significant wildfire activity has ceased at the community edge. The community is burning and spreading the fire from the houses and other flammable materials within the community to maintain fire spread through the community. The community burn continues to burn without the wildfire. So let's take a look here. This is the Angora fire in 2007, South Lake Tahoe. The intense wildfire burning roughly along the the river at 2.30, passes the community at 2.30. A surface fire from the flank of that intense wildfire spreads through what, as it turns out, is a fuel treatment. The trees survive, although scorched, but the low intensity fire spreads to directly to contact houses on the other side of the residential street on the wildland side ignite and at 3.30 to 5 the community burns initiated from the burning houses and notice the vacant lots where there are no houses didn't burn with high intensity. So what do unconsumed vegetation and homes adjacent to total destruction indicate? That wildfire does not spread through the community like a lava flow, a flash flood, or a tsunami that explodes houses in flame, leaving total destruction in its wake. And in this particular case, this is a particularly extreme scene, local conditions determining the ignition of the house. And this tells us that intense simultaneous heating across wide areas of the community, of the homes within the community and other flammable materials does not occur. So total destruction does not indicate high intensity wildfire exposure. Why? Well, because all the things that would produce the high intensities that might burn towards the structures are unconsumed. So no fire spread through what we view as being the problem. These homes ignited and freely burned from lower intensity ignition sources like surface fire being ignited by burning embers or burning embers directly igniting the homes. And there were no global firefighters to put out these small ignition sources. So although initiated largely by embers from intense wildfires, burning residential fuels, that is the homes and the vegetation within the community continue fire spreading within the community. Take a, a, a bit of a, of a pause here with regard to our attention and look at how that is happening. How is it that we're getting ignitions and total destruction of homes within an area that is unburned? Well, ignitions and thus fire occur by meeting the requirements for combustion, the fuel, heat, and oxygen that are required in sufficiency to produce an ignition and thus fire spread. But what that says is that fire, including extreme wildfire, is just a process. Wildfire spreads when ignition requirements are met at adjacent fuel during wildfires, including extreme wildfires. So we can be assured that when we see fire spreading 
through vegetation or when we see the aftermath of high intensity spread, it spread by meeting the requirements for combustion, one step at a time, a sequence of ignitions that becomes the fire spread. So the requirements for combustion at the fuel surface, not anywhere else. The process of ignition and, and burning that, that results from that occurs right at the surface of the fuel. So fire is not a thing that travels from place to place, like tsunamis, floods, and other natural hazards. So when we, when we think about a flood, we're really looking at a mass that has inundated, at least partially, an area, an area where we live, causing considerable destruction. Or maybe we're talking about high-intensity rainfall after, the, after a burn or, or not. That produces a, a high-intensity washout of downstream beds or arroyos that carry debris that not only in a house, but maybe even knocks it off its foundation. Or let's say a tsunami, which is a, an ocean wave that is transferring momentum that then can flood an area. Or let's, we're talking about California, having lived for 10 years in Southern California, how about earthquakes? Well, that's a disturbance that generates a wave in the in the earth surface moves to rock our houses down or move them off the foundation. Well, so fire is different and that gives us a huge opportunity to prevent wildland urban fire disasters by getting in the way of the sufficiency for ignition and combustion. Well, but we're talking about community fire. We're talking about wildland urban as a home ignition problem. So when we look at the requirements for combustion, homes are the fuel. Heat is from burning materials on and adjacent to the homes. And oxygen is always plentiful. It's not restricted sufficient to prevent ignitions and combustion during wildfires. Well, what that tells us then is that geographic classification interface and intermix don't determine home ignitions. It's the requirements for combustion that determine home ignitions. And thus wildfire, the wildland, initiating community burning, urban, occurs and that is the reason I've been calling it wildland urban fire instead of wildland urban interface fire. Emphasize the fact that it is not a geographic location. It is not something other than being a process. And that gives us a huge opportunity to change the requirements for that process at very local areas. The local conditions in this case were not sufficient for ignition. We had in that case, we have high intensity fire burning around this surviving home. Why? I'm, uh, I'm trying to figure they... Football? No, 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 no. So in this particular case, the home did not meet the requirements for combustion that sustained to burn it. And in this particular case, the local ones without intense wildfire surrounding it were sufficient for ignition. So how far is local? And what conditions principally determine home ignitions during extreme wildfires? So just introduce some of the research that I've done using modeling experiments and examinations to get a sense of what local means and how ignitions 
might occur? Well, the results of this research indicated that the characteristics of a home in relation to burning materials in the immediate surroundings within 100 feet principally determine home ignitions during extreme wildfires. And 100 feet was intended to be an overestimate. Well, so how can 100 feet be an overestimate based on our perception of big flames and the amount of heat to, to us from big flames? So we know, how would we have any idea about what it takes to ignite something? Because human skin sensitivity to thermal pain and injury is so much greater than the heating requirements for wood ignition. For example, a radiant exposure from flames that produces a second degree burn in five seconds on my exposed skin takes over 27 minutes to ignite a wood wall. And what that means, my human perception of ignition requirements is not reliable. My perception is pain and injury, and that's not related at all to what it takes to ignite wood. So let's take a look at an example of how this plays out. So here we are, fire in Southern Cal the aftermath of a wildfire in Southern California, and we see some intense burning that occurred. We'll take a look from, the, from an area and we see where perhaps the, an intense fire occurred. Now, at this particular location, was a strike team, five engines and its leader, and in talking with that strike team leader, he told me that they had to disengage for safety reasons because of the high intensity fire. And it was his perception that that high intensity fire ignited the homes across the street. Now, so the house, this point on the house was a, a little over a hundred feet from the large flames. But the closer object was a, a, a split rail fence post was only 45 feet from that intense burning. When we take a look at the fence, what we find at half the distance of, of the, between the house and the burning is that there was no thermal degradation, no char on this fence, anywhere on this fence face high intensity fire. Well, there was dead leaves from, on the roses, but when we think about the score and the, the killing of foliage on a plant, that's about the same as what causes second degree burns on our exposed skin. So we can't use scorched foliage, dead foliage, heat killed foliage as any indicator of the intent sufficient for ignition. So what we get from these observations and the research is an opportunity to reuse fuels within 100 feet of a home to discontinue intense fire spread within that area that hundred feet to prevent ignitions from intense radiate radiant heating and to prevent surface fire flame contact without necessarily controlling the wildfire. So in this particular case, in this scene, we see a surviving house, intense wildfire in its immediate surroundings, not meeting the requirements for combustion on that. So the home ignitions during extreme wildfires are principally determined by the ignition characteristics of a home in relation to burning objects within a, an overestimated 100 foot distance from a home. And this area is called the home ignition zone. So here's an example, not a model for, not what you'd necessarily have to duplicate, 
home ignition zone result due to or during an intense wildfire. So the crown fire, this, this crown fire, the burn, the intensely burning canopy of these conifer trees spreading didn't ignite this home because of efficient flame heating and the home was ember ignition resistant. So typically extreme wildfires don't spread into developed neighborhoods. So take a look at this. Here we have a continuous spreading high intensity crown fire coming in from there are homes on the wildland side of the fire. They're inside the, the intense wildfire. They're destroyed. Immediately across the street, just 40 feet of canopy gap distance, the Crown Fire didn't continue across that gap. And yet, home destruction occurred without the Crown Fire for another two and a half blocks until it got to the state highway. And that's because of burning embers initiating spot ignitions directly on, on the homes and in its immediate, the flammables in the immediate area. So here's an interest, it's actually kind of enchanting of the kind of burning embers, not necessarily all of them would be capable of igniting a spot ignition. But in this particular case, by the way, this was from the Woolsey fire, a couple of homeowners to deal with the chaos of the ember blizzard due to burning wildland. So burning embers are inevitable during extreme wildfires, but don't embers, don't burning embers come from beyond the home ignition? Clearly they become, come from beyond that hundred feet. So how is that reconciled with the home ignition determining ignitions? Well, yeah, okay. So these wildfires commonly can ignite spot ignitions of a half, a, being half a mile or more from the homes during extreme wildfire conditions. And of course, that depends on vegetation, but regardless of the distance lofted from the wildfire, burning embers only generate home ignitions at locations where they've accumulated within the home ignition zone. So let's take a look at an example of where home ignition ignitions were generated by a shower of burning embers without any fire exposure whatsoever. And this is a demonstration experiment that I was involved in at the Institute for uh, uh, the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety Research Center, as it turns out in South Carolina. So we have a full inside the laboratory where we've got polyvinyl chloride, plastic gutters, aluminum gutter, and another line of PVC gutters. We have pine needle debris in, in the valley where there is a fiberglass asphalt composition covering. We have pine needle around the base and bark mulch. We have vinyl siding, we have fiber, you would might recognize that as hardy plank as a as a product, and we have fiber con composition board. So let's take a look at the demonstration. This is a very realistic demonstration of relatively close range, near range firebrand spotting, where the the high intensity canopy fire in trees or in shrubs is very nearby within a hundred yards or so. And notice that within just a few, we have an ignition in the pine needles at the base of the house. We have ignitions in the rain gutters full of pine needles. All of the fire 
generated around this house is all either on the house in debris or around the very base within five feet of the house and its walls. And notice that in the, in the PVC gutters, the plastic gutters, after burning the needles for a while, they begin to soften, melt, and fall off the house. When they fall off the house, they fall down into something burning, continue to liquefy, melt, and the vapors are now of that plastic gutter. Notice that the aluminum gutters are still on the house. The flames are right up against the eave line. And in this particular case, it ignited stained ignition on the house and we ended up suppressing it. So all of that, starting with the initial Firebrand exposure, igniting flames, igniting fire, burning in debris, resulting in the house significantly involved in fire, all occurred within about two minutes of the exposure. So residential fuels, burning structures and adjacent vegetation and other flammable objects within the, the, the residential are significant sources of embers that continue community fire spread hours after significant wildfire exposures have feet. So here's an example. This is 2003 Cedar Fire in Southern California. And it's at the very last night of the, the significant community burning. There are two houses down at the, down below. And houses burning that are contributing the burning embers. They don't go as far as a wildland ember, but they're bigger. So then what happens, it, or what, what we can say from all of this, is that wildfire disasters do not occur from our earlier perceptions through, through the interview they don't occur from a tsunami of flames sweeping through the community. The houses don't literally explode in flames. It's definitely not a zone. And dragons from hell are not to blame. So how do fire disasters occur? Well, let's start with severe fire conditions. Adequate continuous fuel that can support high intensity fire to some extent. The weather that produces very dry conditions in the fine vegetation, the, particularly the fine dead vegetation that can ignite from burning embers and very strong winds. And of course the topography doesn't change. And then we have an ignition that produces rapid fire spread and high intensity under the severe conditions. And then, and only then, if we have homes that are exposed to these extreme wildfire conditions, we end up vulnerable to those conditions. We have multiple simultaneous home ignitions. And that completely overwhelms fire protection capability. The wildfire can't be suppressed during extreme conditions. And now our fire protection can't cover exposure within the community. And we end up with many homes burning simultaneously that can't be attended. And we end up with a disaster of multiple homes free burning to so wildland urban fire disasters have only occurred during extreme wildfire conditions like those I showed in the tables earlier. When wildfire suppression has been ineffective and structure fire protection was overwhelmed. 
too many houses for too few available firefighters. And this is occurring in Southern California. Uh, tens of thousands of houses and the largest available fire protection capability agency agreements. I often say somewhat humorously in the entire galaxy and still get overwhelmed. During the, the Woolsey fire, there were 700 engines trying to protect thousand houses. So how do we currently attempt to prevent wildland urban fire disasters? Well, this is the way we try to do it. With, fire, with, with emergency response, with the things, the tools of fire suppression. And this fails to prevent wildland urban fire disasters during the extreme wildfire. The inevitability of extreme wildfire conditions and our inability to control extreme wildfires suggests inevitable wildland disasters. However, what we just went through, what we just looked at, we found out that home ignition conditions primarily, the, the home ignition zone conditions primarily determine home ignitions during extreme wildfires. And determine that total destruction commonly starts with small ember ignitions on and adjacent to the home that can be readily prevented if somebody's there. Or if we eliminate the, the ability for that ignition to occur. Let's go back to our disaster sequence. We've got the extreme wildfire, but at this point, we've created an ignition resistant community. We have, a, we have homes where they are ignition resistant, not fireproof, resistant. And that eliminates the overwhelming simultaneous ignition and burning houses. And that means our fire suppression, our fire protection is not overwhelmed. They become more effective in protecting the ignitions that do sustain and the disaster doesn't occur. We can make these ignition resistant by eliminating and reducing ignition factors within the home ignition zone. Wildland urban fire is a problem, not a problem of controlling extreme wildfire. Why? This is a practical statement. We can't control extreme wildfire. We can control the ignitability of the home ignition zone to an ignition resistant home. We can make homes ignition resistant during extreme wildfires by eliminating ignitions from flames within the home ignition, reducing ember ignitions, the vulnerability to ember ignitions of the home itself. So again, Home ignitions during extreme wildfires are a local combustion process determined by local conditions within the home ignition zone. It is interface and intermix or any other geographic classification. So how might we describe an ignition resistant home? Well, it does not have flammable debris on the house and it's flammable and around and on its flammable attachments. It does not have any ignitable material within five feet of the home and its flammable attachments. We do not have any contact from within of the home within the home ignition zone. And we do not have high intensity burning within the home ignition zone. Notice it didn't say we have no fire within the home ignition zone, but the fire that does occur is of low intensity such that it neither produces high intensities that can burn the trees that we care so much about, preserve the trees within the home ignition zone, and it doesn't burn with high enough intensity to produce flame lengths 
that can contact the house and we have nothing burning within five feet of the house. So that means the only mechanism for ignition of the house becomes burning embers from the wildfire and other burning within the community potentially. Building fire codes. Well, most of our fire codes change the fire elements of the building. The materials and designs that have flow, slow flame spread ratings. So we put in our walls and we have extended time wall ceiling and door fire pen penetration hour ratings. You've all heard of the one hour door rating. Well, but wouldn't such fire codes help prevent wildland urban fire? Well, not necessarily. So fire performance codes that facilitate fire control, interior fire involvement rates, assume that there is a firefighter response. But when we go back to the faster sequence, we find out that in vulnerable houses, vulnerable to ignition, what we low ignition performance, we end up with many homes burning without attention and without protection from firefighters, the lack of capability, the lack of availability of firefighters or residents, any sustained ignition on the house and its total destruction. So home ignition resistance during extreme wildfires increases the ignition performance and eliminates most ignition. So it's not just any code that is beneficial for the wildland urban fire. They have to be codes appropriate for wildland urban fire. So for wildland urban fire to be beneficial. So let's take a look at what I will use as an example of maybe the a very good application of fire codes that tend not to exist. So let's take a look at high density home development where we can get structure to structure flame spread ignitions structure to structure. What if we have non-flammable surfaces on the house, walls, eave, and eave boxing, such that it begins to impede the ability for from one house to another? What if in the case, this is Coffee Park after the Tubbs fire, which fire actually never got to Coffee Park other than burning embers, where we have entire community destruction. What if, and this is a what if, I don't want to get into a policy issue, but what if we didn't have such high density? What if at least on one side these houses weren't 10 feet apart? What if they were a little further apart and they had meant siding, non-flammable siding, and eave facing, and eave boxing, and very little space, if any, in the between the structures and no flammable materials, fences, etc., between the houses. Well, so making our homes ignition resistant means having wildfires without wildland urban fire disasters. Thank you. And now for questions and discussion. Jack, this is Stephen Swain. I'm an environmental horticulture advisor at Marin in Sonoma counties. I work um, in this area a little bit with policy. Um, I wanted to know what you thought when we have houses that are so close together that the the neighbor's house becomes one of the greatest risks to 
a given house's uh, burning. Um, are we better, uh, right now we're, we are advocating not having fencing material, say gates that are flammable, go right to the house. But what, when those houses are so close together, should, should we be advocating that people have non-flammable fences between the house as a way of blocking radiant heat, do you think? Can you comment on, on something like that? Yeah, so I've been in these situations most recently in, in Southern California where there's not much you're gonna do about the, the density of housing. As you mentioned, and I suggested this to a couple of residents that I talked to personally, that fence that you have two houses, if that fence has some non-flammable material, and what I suggested was something on of, of fiber cement or uh, something, some kind of cladding perhaps with fire rated drywall underneath, which is a way of making, that has been used to make wood roofs uh, class A on house where you have a non-flammable subsheathing under a flammable covering. And so actually I recommend any kind of, of flammable material between two houses that can burn in any way. Plus, or, or masonry stucco is a very non-flammable surface material on the houses themselves. But it's a good idea to have both houses that surface. And then of course you can also buy fiber cement facing material as well as panel for enclosing the eaves. And also let's remember, and I'm not sure why other than for light, you any size of window that was transparent between houses, particularly when they're that close together. So let's get rid of the windows between the houses other than maybe wire glass that's translucent to get, uh, and typically those are bathrooms to get light bathroom. That's, that's my suggestion. Good, thank you yeah. very much. Anybody else? Well, let me, um, to, to block some, let me, uh, first of all, let me make sure that I'm, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm I think about as well as I can. Um, let me ask this question. There, I've got two questions here that are very similar. One of, Pass is a larger defensible space more important than structure hardening? In other words, decreasing the, uh, the ignition ability directly of the house. And the second question that's related uh, is I'm curious about so fuel brakes. And they specifically cite the 2017 Tubbs fire that crossed uh, several locations of uh, uh, across Highway 101, uh, and the the comment was with apparent ease. Uh, so interestingly enough, larger defensible space is essentially putting up a, a gap, a barrier. So let's recall that the the scene of the 40 feet between canopies of the residential street. And the high intensity fire wasn't capable of crossing that street, but what about firebrands? Because firebrands easily can loft a half a mile in these intense fires, particularly like like the campfire in paradise or the Woolsey fire, which is a different vegetation type, but we're still have air brands traveling a half a mile to a mile in the and it was longer than that in the campfire to create ignition. 
not practical to have fuel breaks when it is readily practical to reduce our ignitability. So with regard to defensible space, and by the way, I resist using the term defensible space, it tends to imply that there's somebody, there's going to be a firefighter there to protect the structure, to defend the structure. When we saw that human sensitivity to heat is greatly more than the ability to ignite some wood, for example, we find out that defensible space has to be a safety zone that is larger than the home ignition zone. Okay, so the bottom line is it's much easier for us to have resistant home ignition zone than it is for somebody else to create fuel breaks. And the bottom line with or fuel treatments is that the greatest effect on fire behavior is found within the in the fuel break or this fuel treatment, typically uh, some kind of a thinning project in a forested area. So Frequently, Highway 101, all the way from Southern California and then continuing through Northern California, is potted over. It, the burning embers frequently fly over Highway 101 in Southern California. That's three to five lanes, depending on where we're at, in both directions with a median and pull out space on either side. Frequently, when I was in Southern California, we would say, well, as the coming in from Ventura County, if it gets across the Ventura Freeway before we can deal with it, it'll go to the ocean in extreme conditions if they persist. And that happened, that's happened, at least from my standpoint, from my experience, that's happened three different times, three different incidents where it was common that the fuel break, Highway 101, was lofted across. It wasn't the flames, it was the burning embers. So any other questions? Hi, this is Janet Ruiz with the Insurance Information Institute. Um, my question is, do you have are you seeing any specific examples of homes or maybe even actual communities that are successfully uh, hardening the homes? That's a good question. Probably the, let me give you an example of uh, Rancho Santa Fe in Southern California, if you're familiar with that. We're not yeah. talking. Yeah, we're not talking the low rent district. Yeah. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the and I can't immediately remember his his name, but the fire quite progressive with regard to emphasizing the ignition resistant home ignition zone in Rancho Santa Fe with the homeowners, emphasizing the results of that ignition resistance being uh, the safety of the home, enhance life safety of the residents, as well as firefighters that might be responding. So during the fire, as well as the following during uh, the witch, in those cases, and particularly the Cedar Fire that I burned into Rancho Santa Fe, what there are five different communities with different names in this overall development. Many of the people evacuate and there was no high intensity. And as I recall, there was zero destruction of homes within that general. Um, the, the other development, and I'm trying to remember now, and this um, it's a higher density development. Oh, I just had a brain gap. 
Uh, this is a development in Santa Clarita area, Valencia area, which is North San Fernando Valley, North LA County uh, development. Um, the ranch. Anyway, that was that has had two exposures uh, fire in the, the chaparral type of community. And actually, it's mostly the coastal chaparral kind of, of community, coastal sage kind of chaparral. It has had two exposures over the last 20 years, and it has had any destruction in it, as I also recall. And there was pre-positioning of LA County fire uh, uh, strike teams, engine strike teams that stayed with the community in case there were sustained ignitions. It seems like uh, this might, these communities might help us with our further education um, showing these examples, especially when they had fire coming their way and didn't burn. So I think that's really helpful. Exactly. So let me mention that, that there have been communities in the past that were designated as, as firewise. And I'm thinking specifically about Fountain Grove 2, where indeed there was uh, significant destruction during the Tubbs fire. But when I went to the website with regard to what they were doing, it, they emphasized vegetation removal and chipping as opposed to reducing the of the house itself, its specific vulnerabilities like flammable inside corners and debris, uh, flammable furniture, um, the, the, uh, the barbecue grill that uses uh, briquettes that are out that bottle of, of liquid lighter, you know, next to the bag, to the, to the paper bag, that kind of thing. Um, junipers, wild, crazy junipers that are right up next to the house. That was not emphasized on the website. And saw in the pattern of destruction from Fountain Grove 2 was essentially unburned vegetation, particularly next to the golf course, destruction of the home. And by the way, readily available to, to see off of Google, the, the Coffee Park destruction looked down the line. And as it turns out, um, the, the wind was blowing roughly along the, the long axis of the residential development. We see unconsumed vegetation, be, you know, at the street side, as well as in areas that are affected by burning structures. Jack, we have a number of questions in the chat, and I think that these two um, from Arthur and Larry are somewhat related. Arthur is asking about. Um, uh, wildfire spread through vegetated areas and how the composition of the vegetation brings the wildfire to the community. Um, and Larry is asking about the um, glass wildfire in particular. It was a high severity fire over a large area. Um, did not seem to be exacerbated by houses, but what are your thoughts? Uh, let me make sure that I un understand the what I'm, I exactly understand the question. Just quickly summarize that again. Sure, sorry. And they might not be totally related. Um, maybe well, I'll just take, I'll take. Um, yeah, at least one. Arthur's <laughs> first, <laughs> yeah. So he, he asks, um, rapidly spreading wildfires seem to occur when the vegetation reaches a certain density of trees which then brings the fire into the wildland urban zone. Is that true? And is there any way that the vegetation composition can, can break up or slow down that progression of fire? Yeah, okay. 
Um, so thank you for the question. And one of the things that I've significantly noticed is that, and, and this was particularly true, interestingly enough, on the campfire, when, when it got to the outskirts, and this is particularly scenes from Paradise, when it started getting to the outskirts, due to roads and some development and then and then forest cover when the crown farm started getting to gaps and the, these gaps are sometimes relatively subtle like the the 40 feet roughly two canopy canopies on either side of the road that you saw in that in that video in that photo scene uh, that happened to be in Arizona it begins to significantly disturb the ability of the crown fire to ignite an adjoining canopy. Uh, let me, just as an aside, the last 10 years of what I did in, uh, of before I retired in fundamental fire research was to how local and what the ignition mechanism, the heat transfer mechanisms of fine material. And what we found ongoing is that flame contact, the convective heat transfer from flame contact is extremely important in actually continuing the spread of wildland fire. So when we get the disturbance of continuity into developed areas, we see that it becomes more difficult for the crown you. And that's exemplified in total destruction of, for example, that the, um, the senior living that was largely modular homes, uh, totally destroyed with the exception of maybe a half a dozen scattered homes, surrounded by pretty continuous conifer canopy. But when we go beyond that, we find out that there were in that canopy that kept the, the, the fire from burning intensely in the canopy, but there was surface fire. Now, if we have sufficient dead material below the canopy, and then begin to continue that, that crown fire, even though it might be blocked. So what we get is, high intensity crown fire that maybe goes to the surface and then comes back up again when there is intense enough surface intensity, uh, high enough surface intensity to ignite the canopy of the trees over an area large enough to where instead of just a, a torching tree, we get a more continuous cohesive line of high intensity involvement. So what happens if we have deciduous trees in interspersed, a mix of, of deciduous trees and conifers? What we tend to get is a significant disruption of the ability for the fire to spread through the deciduous trees and continue. And if we have enough mixture, we will end not having that high intensity fire spread continuing. And that has happened on several fires that I've been there. I mean, this comes to my mind immediately with regard to Southern California in the mountain areas like the San Bernardino Mountains, uh, black oak interspersed with white fir and, and ponderosa or Jeffrey pine with incense cedar. And that black oak mixture with a canopy in between those conifers was sufficient to break up the So that's a hint with regard to our home ignition zones. So we want the trees. So if we've got deciduous hardwoods, then that's good to keep at 
as a mixture with perhaps the conifers that we want to keep, whether they're redwoods or whether they're uh, the, the pine. Um, and also, once we start gapping within the home ignition zone, if we don't have any beyond the home ignition zone or the community of overlapping home ignition zones, keep that white fir or that spruce, we need to make sure that the low branches are pruned up and no fuel, no dead fuel underneath, heavy accumulations of needles or branch material, especially, or anything else that can produce enough intensity to ignite the lower branches of the trees we want to keep and essentially burn the canopy of the tree, which kills the tree, which we really don't want to have happen anyway. So it serves dual purpose. And the trees that we want, as well as keeping our house from having an intense or a sufficient exposure, either from firebrands or flames to ignite it. Um, that's so interesting. So it sounds like you're giving us some advice about the um, the forest composition and kind of the, the species of trees within and how they have a role in carrying or or slowing fire. You've also talked about the homes and how if they have space between them so they're not as dense of communities that they um, are, are um, less able to transfer heat from building to building. Um, I have a question here about the um, built community level and how you know what kind of changes you would suggest at the at the whole community level so um kaylin writes what strategies are the most effective for towns and cities to defend themselves against catastrophic wildfire i'm interested in how the principles of home hardening and defensible space can be scaled up to the community level interestingly enough the physics doesn't change as we densify, if that's a word, our, our residential uh, development. So if we have a community where every their own home ignition zone, well, the home ignition zone is on the order of uh, about an acre and a half. Well, an awful lot of communities, like all of our suburban communities, don't have that kind of space, that kind of privately owned space. So let me start with that. So some of the fires that I've been on and examined, they do have a level of ownership. And that means that they essentially control the, the treatment of that. So they thin their trees out um, progressively as going towards the house. And this is this can be found in the on the firewise.org website. That's the National Fire Protection Association website. So basically what you do from roughly 30 to 100 feet is gapping the trees, gaps between three to four trees and a cluster or individual trees. It doesn't have to plantation in Georgia. So what you do is you gap the trees so that you have a minimum of about 10 feet between the canopy of the trees, which if they do ignite from continuous forest at your property line, they will quickly begin to not carry continuous cohesive flame front of high intensity foliage burning in. Okay, so now we've reduced that, and now from 30 feet to the house, we don't cut out buildings, firewood, whatever. We don't want that to ignite and potentially put firebrands by. And keep in mind, the winds are blowing hard, okay? And let's assume that everywhere around the house, the wind is blowing house. So if you've got an outbuilding of any size whatsoever, 
within that 30 feet, it jeopardizes your home. So you want to treat that outbuilding the same way that you treat the home. Well, so that means the five foot space around it ignite. And now you're having to go out a little bit further with the, with the opening up of the tree canopy. Now, great advantages we have from foliage burning producing high intensities is that the duration of the burning intensity, well, let me back up and say the high intensity is due to uh, all that mass foliage igniting and burning within a very short period of time. Why? Well, because all of available, but it only takes anywhere from 10 to 15 seconds for a, a, a foliage particle needle to totally consume, which means that the entire crown fire, the torching tree or that continuous crown fire will consume a location in 30 to 40 seconds or less. And that length of duration is a huge advantage to in preventing the sufficiency for ignition, the conditions for ignition. So that's, that's where structure, lower intensity, but it burns for 20 to 40 minutes, you know, that potentially can put flames or radiant heats ignition. So as we get higher and higher density, perhaps, well, up with ownership, multiple ownership of our home ignition zone. That doesn't change the physics. So if we've got out on our totally owned, privately owned home ignition zone, that's no different other than maybe the size. But if I've got buildings and a barn within my home ignition zone, 30 feet from the house or closer, that's no different than having neighbors closer. What changes is the social dynamics. That means we have to cooperate socially. That's the problem, <laughs> right? The physics is relatively simple, which by the way is why I'm a research physical scientist and not a social, because now as a friend used to tell me, well, geez, you know, this, this home ignition zone, ignition resistance isn't rocket science. What about that, Jack? Well, Pat, it's, it's not really a, a physical fire problem. It's a social science problem. It's not a fire science. It's a social science problem. His response was, oh, we're screwed. So what we've got now with a community where we've got overlapping home ignition zones, which, oh, by the way, scattered housing where individuals own their home ignition zone, we tend not to have, by my definition, arbitrary definition of a there being 100 or more homes destroyed, we tend not to have the disaster. Why? Because they're scattered out all over the place and we just can't get 100 houses to burn. We might have all the houses burning, or we might have 30% of the houses burning, but it's not 100. Or so where do we have our biggest disasters? Where we have a concentration of homes such that we've got overlapping homing zones. And now it becomes a community problem. Each individual home ignition zone collects becoming ignition resistant to produce an ignition resistant community. That was a great answer. Um, can I follow up with another question? Um, so this is something that comes up all the time. Um, Jared asks, what are your thoughts on external sprinkler systems, especially on rural single home systems? So let's think about the condition which we actually have an overwhelming exposure from the wildfire and then an overwhelming exposure
such that the fire protection is largely unavailable for most of the homes, okay? Let me just start off immediately by making the statement, passive ignition resistance is most readily available and trustworthy approach to the problem. It's not that water doesn't work. If it can be and applied effectively. So now let's think about the conditions under which our fire protection, but particularly fire protection, is overwhelmed. Well, it's in these extreme, these severe weather extreme fire conditions. It's the conditions where the wind is blowing 40, 50 miles an hour and very dry. So I was, uh, I was examining a fire in Southern California called Panorama in 1980, where the winds were particularly that day on the order of 70 miles an hour. Average winds 50 to 60 gusts and a greater. The response was not in parity with exposure, but it was large. So we've got a Southern California response into this residential neighborhood of North Park, San Bernardino. They have type one engines that can inundate a single house. They set up charged two inch straight stream, goes about 30 feet and just goes into a mist into the high wind. Couldn't get close enough and the and as it turns out North Park this area that burned had flammable wood roofs and they couldn't keep up embers igniting more of the neighborhood and moving on. So the bottom line is where you've got a sprinkler system in it to keep the ignitions from occurring on and immediately around the house most of our application water during the conditions that we would perhaps implement it during the fire is largely going to get blown away. And not only that, but the difficulty of starting the system so that it's effective when the from the burn of the fire of the wildfire occurs is difficult to time. So what about water? When would be potentially the greatest effect on the wildfire? Well, so if we're talking about a well-forecasted situation, weather situation, like a Southern California, intense Southern California, Santa Ana, or an intense wind in Northern California, typically, you, the weather service can see the, the development of the weather pattern such that it can be forecast a couple of days ahead. At that point, given that the local conditions, so given that you don't have, you know, continuous conifer canopy all the way from wildland overhanging your house, if you've got a relatively ignition resistant home ignition zone, the best time to use that water is periodically, three times a day, to dampen the materials next to your house. Suppose you still have that mulch and you don't have time or the energy to start raking it away from your wood walls. What might well, what you might do about it is to start sprinkling that local area to start dampening up the fuels. The surface dries, but you end up making the, the lower levels higher moisture content, less likely to lose moisture content, particularly when two to three times a day, you're dampening it with water. Uh, and this is potentially before the winds are even blowing. It may be dry, the sun is out, but 
you can apply the water effectively and moistened so that it's easier to absorb water when you're continuing to dampen it up. One of the things caution that I've run into significantly, particularly in my part of the world in Montana, is people will put sprinklers on their metal roof and start sprinkling continuously for 24 hours day after day. And number one, the water doesn't help with the non-flammable roof. Number two, it starts puddling up, which means that it's doing over water. Now, th the whole reason that it's puddling is because it's not being absorbed. So go somewhere else with your application of water. So you put your sprinklers not on your walls where you're going to get water damage and it's the least likely night from firebrands. A vertical wood wall is the least likely, I mean, particularly if it's a um, any kind of kind of whether it's shiplap or or a uh, fiber composition board maybe not if it's cedar shakes perhaps but but kind of the bottom line is your vertical surfaces don't accumulate firebrands so look at dampening the material around the house before you need it not during the conditions when it's least effective in damping the material. Thank that you, that works? was a great answer. Um, I'm gonna open up the floor to see if anyone would like to ask their question out loud. Um, go ahead and unmute yourself um, if you have one. Um, otherwise, we've got a couple other questions from the chat that I can pull from, but just wanted to open up the floor. Hi, Jack, this is Jean um, Wetzel Chin. I'm uh, chair of Ukiah's Western Hills Fire Safe Council. And uh, we have a, a really big issue because many of the people in the Western Hills are retired or are elderly and finances um, are limited and home hardening is really expensive. Cal Fire is really great about helping with uh, the veg management for the roads and they'll get, you know, we'll get some chippers out there with trucks that can haul the chips away. But when it comes to actual work for home hardening, um, you know, we need to have some uh, big incentives, um, some kind of system, whether it has to go through legislation or whatever. Um, has anyone asked you about that? Because that would make a huge difference. You're t it sounds like home hardening is the main thing we need to be doing for our home ignition zone. So one of the assumptions, and, and of course, this, thank you for the question. Um, one of the assumptions is that all ignition resistance retrofitting is expensive. And my comment on that is, okay, if you've got a flammable wood roof, that's expensive. And there's not much that I can say other than if you've got a flammable wood roof, you got to get rid of it. You have to change it out. Okay, so now I'm talking about an expense, a significant expense. Okay, so let's, let's put that situation over here and say, yeah, okay, if you've got a flammable wood roof, it's expensive. What about the rest of my property? Okay, so number one, what I have found is that the, the, one of the greatest problems with our houses is not necessarily its materials, but it's the debris that's on and around the house. So it's the pine needles at the inside, at the flammable inside corner of our decks. It's the flammable patio furniture or deck furniture that's next to our wood walls or the lathing that's on our deck rails or, or next to the big plate glass windows. So these kinds of ignitions that can occur from burning embers pine needles in the rain gutters that 
burn and put flames right up at our eave line that in all too many cases, we don't even have metal drip flashing and it almost immediately ignites the facing board and the subsheathing, which then smolders for a little while and then goes into the attic and we end up with a totally destroyed house. None of those things, particularly the, the maintenance, the annual maintenance of getting rid of debris from the trees we wanna keep, which is, I'll, I'll get to that in a moment, it, that material needs to be removed on a seasonal basis or a multi-seasonal basis, depending on, on the kind of debris deposition that you get. That's not very expensive, it's labor intensive. If you can't do it yourself, then you start having to pay somebody and it gets a little bit more expensive. But it's not like having to completely reside your house with fiber cement. It's not like you're gonna to have to tear your deck down and rebuild it with some kind of material with a better design that isn't ignitable. So, and removing big trees around your house that you don't wanna remove anyway. I mean, let me give you an anecdote. Going up to a house, so I'm greeting the homeowner the first thing the homeowner says is, are you gonna make me cut down my trees? And I'm looking and it's maybe four trees around the house with one coming up through the deck. And I say, no. And there's this big sigh of relief. And then I say, but you're going to have to work for those trees. You're going to have to get all of the debris that those trees drop on and around your house clear, particularly when you get to fire season, which means in California these days, we're talking about March through December or when it quits raining to when it starts raining again, okay, which might be 12 months. So the bottom line is, and, I, and I've had this conversation with others where they immediately say, well, it's really expensive. And I say, not financially. It's labor expensive, it's attention expensive, but it's not necessarily financially intensive. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, did that answer the question? Yes, so one, okay, let me add on to that. Yeah, uh, yeah. The soffits, um, how important is it to do the soffits? Is it okay to, not have the expense of putting those boards up there to make it a flat surface. If the fire hits the house and goes up, you've taken care of the debris. Is it all right to not have to do the soffits? So interesting. So this is where the context between wildland urban fire and a standard house fire begins to drift away from one another. So the bottom line is no flame contact on the structure, period. That, that doesn't mean you have to rebuild your house. It means that you have to get the, the easily ignited material away from the house and its flammable attachments. Now, I don't want to trivialize that as a process necessarily, but I do want to emphasize that it's a relative, a, a, a readily available option that you can have, okay? And yes. that means that your eaves, even big eaves, and frankly, I'm an advocate of fairly big eaves because it keeps water away from your walls and we don't want your house to rot down before we can have it burned down, okay? I'm, I'm my attempt at, but the, the bottom line is, that if we've got an open eave area that isn't boxed or soffited, the biggest problem with that is not burning embers accumulating in an inverted surface or vertical surfaces. It's what kind of attic venting do I have? Do I have a gable roof, open eaves with gable vents that are more vulnerable 
catching in the screens and then going or no screen going into the attic that maybe ignite something in the attic. Well, how do we deal with that? Well, have blown in insulation that covers up all the horizontal surfaces in your attic space. And that gives you better uh, 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 heat and cool uh, with your interior space. So if you've got block vents, those are more vulnerable than having enclosed eaves with strip vents out at the edge, which tend to act like the more expensive vent trap kinds of venting. So it doesn't have to be expensive. It just has to be attended. Thank you. So I think since we're only two minutes away from the top of the hour, um, we'll say, we'll wrap it up. I wish we had time for more questions, but um, if you feel like you still have an unanswered question, feel free to email it to me. Um, I will put my email in the chat and um, I'll send um, these on to Dr. Cohen and we'll see if we can get a few answers out there via email. Um, thank you so much, uh, Jack, for coming and presenting to us today. It, it was an amazing presentation. Well, you're very welcome and thank you for Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Take care, everyone. <laughs>